This is the Serial and Midnight Podcast, Episode 6. Guys, how are you? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath Holland. We got a, a great conversation, so I'm going to cut right to it. We're talking to Mike Malloy, tough guy movie expert, Mike Malloy. Now, Mike is an expert on tough guy movies. He's also an expert on Euro crime. In fact, I can think of no one better qualified to talk about the topic than Mike Malloy because he wrote and directed the documentary Euro crime, the Italian cop and gangster films that ruled the 70s. For my money, it is still the definitive documentary about Euro crime. What is Euro crime? We're talking about the uh, the cr- corrupt the crime movies of the 60s and the 70s, corrupt corrupt cops and the mafioso and you know one man against against the team of corruption, kind of the Serpico thing, but in Europe. And there was a, a whole decade full of these films that did really interesting things with low budgets. They accomplished so much. Um, Mike is an authority on that subject, but he's also an authority about tough guy movies. We're talking about Lee Van Cleef, who he wrote a biography about. We're talking about Lee Marvin with Charles Bronson. And it's, it's interesting for me because as we're having this conversation, as I'm recording this episode, within the last six months or so, I mean, we have been flooded with these kinds of movies. And I'm so happy for this because we need it. It's something we've been lacking in our, whatever this entertainment marketplace, this sphere, you know, we got so many comic book movies that dominate. We've got horror movies that take up a lot of oxygen. What happened to our tough guys? Yeah, you could name a few tough guys, but uh, the things have really changed. And we are now seeing a revival of some of these things via home entertainment, via home media. So. Just within the last six months, six months, I'm thinking of an Arrow box set called Rogue Cops and Racketeers that was released. Uh, there's Keanu Lover's putting out a ton of Charles Bronson movies, Chuck Norris movies, not not the martial arts movies, but the earlier '70s tough guy movies with Chuck Norris, uh, and so many European films, French films, Italian films. These things are finally finding their way to Blu-ray in really fine. HD transfers, and I'm seeing new audiences discover them. I'm seeing people talking about them, wondering what they are. So now is the time for us to rely on guys like Mike Malloy to tell the story. I think you're going to enjoy this. It's a little bit controversial because Mike says what's on his mind, and I want you to know that's why I asked him to be here. I wanted him to be frank. I wanted him to tell his thoughts. I wanted him to tell it like it is. What is his opinion of what he sees going on right now? Where did our tough guys go? Uh, What's the value of these movies? That's the guy to talk to about this. And so I really hope that you enjoy this. Uh, Some people are going to disagree with some of the things in this episode. I want to make it clear. That's okay. We don't all have to agree on everything, but I think it's important that we speak our mind and that we are able to do that, that we feel free to speak what, uh, what we believe. So we're talking in this conversation about tough guy movies, but we're also talking about uh, independent cinema or the lack thereof, how hard it is to get something made these days. We're talking about the boutique Blu-ray markets. Uh, and the undercurrent through all of this is uh, our the, the manly men that we don't really see a lot of at the box office these days, and uh, we miss them. But uh, that's the conversation. I did not reference uh, Mike's social media platforms in this video. I'm going to link to those in the description of this video. I will probably pop them up on the screen as well. I know his, uh, his YouTube channel, which we should have mentioned in the video. He has a wonderful YouTube channel where he's... Uh, post a lot of stuff. He, he's constantly contributing special features to releases. Uh, he's just contributed a wonderful split screen mini documentary, you know, about split screen, about the use of split screen in the '60s and the '70s. Uh, that's on a railroad release of Nick the Sting, a Fernando De Leo film called Nick the Sting. You know, Fernando De Leo, uh, huge influence on Quentin Tarantino. So he talks a little bit about you know the the challenges of making these documentaries where he thought he was going to be after making the euro crime documentary it's a really interesting conversation with uh, really no pulls no no punches pulled no holds barred and i uh, i really appreciate mike for being here look guys i'm just going to cut right to it you got to hear this interview mike malloy tough guy movie expert Okay, I got to Troy. You went to Troy. I think that's really interesting. Why did you go to Troy? Well, I didn't want to go to college at all, but my, you know, I grew up in the, the uh, during my college years, that was the 1990s when every kid was expected to go to college, no matter what he or she wanted to do. Um, and so my parents kind of put the arm on me to go to school. Um, my, uh, orth- my uh, 
oral hygienist. My oral hygienist said, yeah, well, you know, my son went to Troy. And it's like, sounds good enough to me. And so I dashed off an application to Troy, the only college I applied to. They accepted me and gave me a full academic ride. So I said yes to Troy. Um, I cranked, They were on the quarter system. So I cranked out a degree in three years somehow. Um, and I, you know, was just doubling up on classes. And I... I opted for the remedial classes whenever I could. And the teachers would be like, uh, Mike, we don't think you should be in this class. And I was like, no, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> and instead, what I used my time for, instead of doing the homework and stuff, uh, I used my time. I got my first book deal to write Lee Van Cleef's biography. He was the bad and the good, the bad and the ugly. And um, so, yeah, that uh, cranked out a double major in three years and got my first book deal in college all by going to Troy State and full academic ride. I think I may have had to pay for the cafeteria, but. Oh, how, where does that motivation come from? Where does that, um, I, when I think of you, I think of like a very uh, aggressive go-getter type. You're very motivated. You get a lot of stuff done. You have written, I mean, you're an author, you're a filmmaker, you're a historian as well. Where does it come from? Well, I don't like that H word. That's for nerds, man. <laughs> um square man um yeah it's weird i feel like i'm in blu-ray supplements right now just kind of to stay sane um because as dysfunction is on the rise budgets are on the decrease so uh you know, the Blu-rays in between selling a script or something like that. Uh, I actually, I, I get scripts option from time to time. I haven't had a big screenplay sale since uh, we wrote the, my uh, frequent collaborator and I, Eric Zaldivar, we co-wrote the official Django sequel for Franco Nero, uh, you know, it was being done as a $10 million movie. And the big pushback we got against it, we had all kinds of A-list Hollywood people involved too. The big pushback we got against it was not that the script was bad, not that the premise was bad, not that the people attached were bad. It's just there was no mechanism for making a 10 million dollar movie uh so as you know you may have known the middle class is evaporating out of america and even at a accelerated rate it's evaporating out of you know uh, modern movie making uh so uh i do get scripts option from time to time and i do get involved with feature uh doc film projects but cinema docs that is but like i said being on this blu-ray treadmill uh keeps me kind of sane uh, because I don't really have to rely on collaborators. Like I said, dysfunction seems to be on the rise. Um, and, uh, you know, I get to be kind of a one man band, which is no disrespect to any shooter or musician or anything that, you know, uh, collaborates with me because I've gotten some great help in those areas. But I get to be kind of a one man band and I get the appearance of being a productive go getter. Look, I fooled you, didn't I? Uh, you know, you get this output, you know, every, you know, month you have one or two supplements coming out and, uh, you get the wonderful satisfaction of seeing them to the finish line in a short time that doesn't drive you and your health, you know, into the poorhouse. I think a lot of this conversation is going to be, uh, dealing with the current entertainment studio system. Just what if this, this cultural thing we're living through right now, you just talked about the middle class, is the best way to go forward to just do things yourself? And and is there a limit to that? Is there a cost to that? Like you can you you can't go make a whole movie by yourself, really. Can you? Um no, I don't advise it. The, the the real solution is very, very easy, but it just and it's a very simple one, and it, it actually requires less of us instead of more. Uh, but it's to tap the brakes and to make fewer, better, bigger projects. That is the because uh, unfortunately we're at a race to the bottom of if this arms race of you know constantly creating content is in fact a race to the bottom uh, it really is um and i don't mean to tell tales out of school but you told me that you felt like you're on the work treadmill you said that you have you know feel a pressure to you know post a video every day uh, yeah, would yeah. you so to put you on the spot would you prefer to have because you've also said i've seen a lot of your videos where you say the big fascination is in the industry side of the boutique blue uh industry would you rather have like a half hour kind of industry show uh once a week where you have different segments you have different interview segments and stuff like that so you you have a proper set uh, which is no disrespect to your collection there but um would you would you prefer that instead of being you know pressured to to produce because you know that's the big thing is everybody feels like uh, if i don't you know keep up with the joneses somebody else the algorithm is going to favor them um yeah that's the thing this algorithm on youtube encourages 
daily posts. Sure. And sometimes it feels like that's not even enough because you see these numbers shrinking. You see, you know, you, you, you have, they give you so much, you know, they give you enough that you can drive yourself crazy. And then on a corporate level, YouTube says, no, no, we don't want you to burn yourself out. We don't want you to feel like you have to post every single day. We want you to take care of yourself, but everything that you have to, to make your decisions says counter to that. It's just the exact opposite. So, and then you, you mix that with what we're dealing with as far as home media, which is, um, I mean, a lot of the studios are just getting it out. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we are in a, our whole society seems geared to quantity over quality. And I think that's reflected in our art. I think it's reflected in total agreement. Um, so yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot or denigrate what you're doing with your YouTube. I just, I'm assuming you feel the exact same frustration as I do, uh, where your choice is to um, either look like you're not producing or to, uh, you know, uh, just join this race to the bottom where the algorithm is just yeah. uh, forcing you to. Uh, so uh, yeah, in the feature film realm, I, I've, you know, I, I don't say yes to micro budget projects as an on camera person. I don't say yes to micro budget projects as far as letting my scripts sell. Um, and, you know, I know people that make three features a year, which is insane. And I don't understand why somebody can't tap the brakes, uh, pool their resources and make one feature every three years instead. Um, mm -hmm. That seems like the, because really we're just junking up the pop culture landscape with a bunch of stuff that's not breaking through. And you're burning up friendships, you're burning up personal finance, you're you know running your health into the ground. Uh, Mike Malloy says no. I get asked to, you know, do uh, Blu-ray supplements where people say, well, you know, look, we only have this budget and, you know, that's not really, uh, you know, commensurate with some of the work you do. So maybe you could just point a camera at yourself and extemporize about this or that. And I was like, well, I probably could do that, but I really don't think that that's, that's not really worthy of being seen uh, as much as I need to get paid and keep the lights on. So even if I accept these low dough uh, projects and honestly, which ones aren't low dough projects? Um, I always end up, you know, doing more than that. I always uh, rewatch the movies. I script something out. I just think that's worthy of being seen. So maybe the arms race of supplements, which is quantity over quality, uh, again in the Blu-ray world too. I feel like there's, uh, you know, uh, the fans have just gotten used to, uh, you know, because you know, there's there's no dirtier words than bare bones. Uh, but you know, they want to see, you know, including 30 hours of new extras, um, you know, instead of doing the 30 hours, uh, maybe you just hire a book, a couple of us, and, uh, we do something that really is worth seeing. It's, it's this interesting time that we're living in where these movies that we, you know, we have all this access and I feel like the meaning of it means less than ever. It doesn't seem to have the value that it used to have. Yeah, you tell me. I think I've uh, noted that some of these these guys who have become cinephiles and technophiles and uh, you know home video files, they they learn certain buzzwords, and so you know uh, they just kind of latch on. They they almost want to prove that they know certain buzzwords, and mm -hmm. you know so they uh, didn't like the DNR, didn't like the didn't like the, um, and you know I actually know certain labels that have passed on titles that I would have loved to see back on the marketplace just because yeah. they don't want to get torn apart by fans by having a you know slightly substandard release so uh yeah I'm I'm with you I'm uh content is king uh you know would love to see some of these long lost movies out to the world uh but again these these um these labels feel like that they're going to get torn to shreds by fans if they use substandard elements um well there's that and then there's this push for low content right people want low they want horror they want and listen i like horror i've got a there's a halloween box set right over here i enjoy horror but horror leads all the formats it seems like and you are a tough guy movie expert you are a euro crime expert and these are not movies that are necessarily accessible to today's audience that just wants to be fed with candy bars yeah so in the 80s, I guess, maybe 90s, uh, horror got this reputation amongst filmmakers, low budget filmmakers, uh, that horror is a genre that sells itself. You don't need stars. Uh, and so that, you know, they estimate that 80% of independent film production is horror. Uh, and 
I think it's just because because of those reasons, you know, horror's not my bag, uh, not to knock it, you know, different strokes. It takes all kinds, live and let live. But man, oh, man, horror has become the laziest genre, both the, you know, as far as the production of it and the fandom of it. Um, I just feel like there's this infrastructure of horror magazines and horror streaming platforms and horror film festivals that doesn't exist for any other genre. And it just has created this kind of like nonstop delivery machine for people to consume horror. And um, yeah, I just like, for me, if you want pure entertainment, you can go to a fireworks show, you can get on a roller coaster, you can do all kinds of things. Um, I like, you know, we're all careening towards the grave. We're all just looking for some diversion as we careen towards the grave. So, you know, whatever. But I get entertainment out of some, you know, these 70s tough guy movies. They they feel like they're both entertainment, they're diverting myself from my pending death. Uh, and they're also teaching me about the human condition. They're teaching me because I don't like macho bullshit. A lot of people try to, you know, pejoratively describe what my interests are and my professional dealings are as macho. Uh, I, I think I like three Stallone films. I don't think I like a single Arnie film. I like the stuff where guys, you know, are met because it's a tough life. It's a tough world. Guys, every man, especially uh, the every man type archetype. I like when they rise to the occasion, they meet the challenge head on. You've watched something like that. You feel like you learned something about the human condition. That's the best of both worlds. So uh, horror doesn't, I, horror has no instructive value to me. Like, what do I learn from horror? Uh, how to slice somebody up with a meat cleaver? I don't know. So, how did you come to tough guy movies and Euro crime movies? Like, what we're ref we're close to the same age. Was it a video store discovery? Was it how? What was your inroad to that? Um, so, the Lee Van Cleef biography set me on the pro professional path, and like you, I became a um, I became a, uh, a critic and a journalist for newspapers. Remember those and magazines. Remember those. Uh, did that for, you know, about 10 years before the world, like I went to bed one night and the world took this global vote without my uh, knowledge. I woke up the next morning and uh, that it ceased to be a paying thing, despite the fact that uh, it was this noble profession for, you know, thousands of years in the human race. Uh, we just decided that writing for a living was going to be, you know, only accepted for the very few. But prior to that, Lee Van Cleef became my favorite actor as a teenager. And uh, I was exposed to a couple of spaghetti westerns, uh, you know, like a sophomore in high school, and I thought they were really, uh, you know, bang up. And then I had a bunch that sophomore year, I had a bunch of uh, seniors as friends. And so guess what, next year, junior year, all those seniors graduated, my circle of friends was gone. So all these spaghetti westerns about loner drifter characters, they certainly uh, had an undue influence on my life. Uh, and so yeah, by the time I was 19, I uh, was in college and plucked a couple of film books off the shelf and uh, sent query letters to the publishers and got my first book deal. Wow. On the subject of, of books, can I ask you if there's any update on the book that you were writing that was literally stolen out from under you? Um, yeah, that. Uh, OK, so. I that that ultimately became my Eurocrime documentary that Eurocrime was born from the ashes of that I was writing a uh, dictionary 70 I had a book contract to write uh, movie tough guys of the 1970s and encyclopedia and um, you know it was about two years in on research and writing on a four year book contract it was a wonderful excuse to rewatch a bunch of films and watch films I had never seen and it was slowly but surely uh, you know I was interviewing some of the stars it was really going to make it one of the linchpins of my career. And uh, yeah, two years in, uh, my wife, my girlfriend and I, um, our house was burgled and they stole both my laptop that I was writing it on because I was writing it in front of the telly all the time, uh, my laptop and my backup drive. Uh, you know, they, my, my flash drive I was backing up to, I had that in my satchel and guess what they grabbed as a loot bag when they were raiding our house, that satchel. So the laptop went into the satchel with the flash drive and out the door just come rockhead had the sweats and the shakes do you know who did it nah we were living in a uh you know uh unsavory neighborhood in east atlanta at the time and uh you know my one of my neighbors kept telling me it was my other neighbor he said yeah as soon as you left the house i saw my other neighbor um out on his cell phone letting people know that you were gone uh but those two neighbors were beefing anyway so who knows what the truth was the uh, police just 
the police just told me to go down to the corner drug house and tell them that uh, I would offer uh, cash reward, no questions asked. Uh, that's the that's the amount of police help I got. Real nice. A, a, another a man alone once again, just a loner against a sea of corruption and crime. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to do this on camera work, I have to stay fit. And uh, so, you know, uh, nobody wants to hear somebody talking about tough guy movies and looking like a fat blob. So, um, yeah, I was going jogging every day in that same neighborhood and, um, you know, jogging unarmed, which I was at the time. Uh, you know, you think about what a you know natural victim you are, because I had my earbuds in and uh, had... Um, you know, was had very poor situational rare awareness because I was listening to music and two guys uh, swooped in with a car to try to box me in where I was jogging. And I ran right his uh, driver's side windows down and I ran right into the muzzle of his pistol. And he was trying to mug me for my iPod because uh, those were still a hot item back in 08. And so I ran around to the back of his car, hoping that he wasn't going to shoot his back window out and just ran down a side road. And he at least had the honor not to shoot me in the back while I was running away. That's unbelievable. I'm glad you got out of there. Uh, yeah. You could have been a, a cautionary tale about East Atlanta. Uh, so let's talk about Eurocrime. Eurocrime. So it's it, for my money, it is still the definitive uh, chronicle of that is it a genre is it a subgenre whatever it is it, euro crime is a fantastic resource for that and uh i would like you to talk to me a little bit about making it and about what that's done for you if it's if it's done anything for you uh well did your readers your readers your uh gentle readers need to know what euro crime is or do you think Go they for it. let's tell them well, yeah, I always try to uh, piggyback off the Spaghetti Western for an explanation of what Euro crime is. Uh, you know, the Italians, the Italian popular cinema is very fat oriented, very copycat oriented. And after they had taken the American Western and made the Spaghetti Western for, you know, from like 64 to 68, you know, those were the high water years. But, you know, on into the 70s, uh, after they had just run that into the ground, um, then uh, they, you know, had to look for what was going to be our next fad. And the Americans came out with uh, crime films on the gangster side, something like The Godfather on the cop side, stuff like Dirty Harry and French Connection. And um, yeah, the Italians just took that and went to town with it from like 72 to 80. That was their dominant action genre. And uh, so I, you know, realized that nobody had really done any kind of, uh, you know, it, uh, boy, you talk about uh, horror dominating, but in the Italian action sphere, it's been spaghetti westerns. And so I, I felt like uh, Euro crime was underserved. And uh, so I did a doc on that and uh, started in 2007 and started in standard def, uh, just, you know, just the ugliest possible standard def footage, and then ended up having to blow it up in HD. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that it connected with the public. I'm so glad that it, you know, uh, got out there and, you know, it's got a I think like it's ninth physical release coming out in early uh, 2023 in France. Uh, so, you know, uh, played at the the Chinese on Hollywood Boulevard at, earlier this year. It was somehow, even though it's a 10 year old doc, uh, the Blu-ray of it was the number one selling documentary on Amazon Japan for a little while. So, uh, you know, this is all wonderful stuff. But, uh, you know, as a doc that I started in 2007 and finished in 2011, I'm kind of just ready to close that chapter of my life because, uh, you know, you know, everything I produce now looks infinitely better and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm very pleased for, you know, Euro crime and, um, you know, very just pleased just to, to you know, kind of crystallize what it was in certain fans minds. Well, it's a really uh, potent explanation of what it is. It's a really good look at what Euro crime is. And you talk to so many people, some of whom have left us now. Yeah. Um, so it's a really good document of what the uh, what that movement is. And I see, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because there are so many studios and distributors that are releasing these films now on Blu-ray. And I mean, just about every week, it seems like something is coming out, you know, uh, in some new scan or whatever. And I'm seeing a lot of curiosity about it. So even now, a, a, you know, over a decade removed from when you finished it, there's still a growing interest in what this, you know, this this Euro crime uh, movement um, and people just aren't they're not really sure what to make of it because as you point out in the documentary and I'm sorry I don't know if, if, if you want to move on from the Eurocrime thing we can but 
Um, I, I got to admit, I never figured I'd be talking about it 10 years after it hit the festival circuit. Uh, I thought I'd be on to bigger, bigger things. And Django Lives promised to be that next big thing. And then Django Lives kind of just uh, uh, fizzled. Was it was it the documentary that introduced you to Nero, to Nero or did it was did you already know him? Uh, no, first met him on our shoot in Miami in 2008. Uh, and that's also where I first met my uh, main collaborator in life, uh, Eric Zaldivar. Uh, Eric and I, Eric is uh, doing his first feature link documentary right now about the farmer and the veterans returning home from war and getting into trouble subgenre. Uh, well, that's a mouthful. Got to <laughs> consolidate that. Got to crystallize that a little better. Um, nice so uh, yeah, he's directing that and I'm producing that, producing that with a guy named John Dunn, who's kind of a newcomer to the feature link stuff. Um, but anyways, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Euro Crime introduced me to both Franco Nero and Eric, and then the three of us uh, worked on. Uh, just amazing to think that uh, Django was this worldwide brand and this worldwide property everywhere except for the U.S. And then Tarantino's film came out, and all of a sudden there was some brand awareness of Django in the U.S. And Franco Nero turns to Eric and I to do the third official Django film. Uh, wow. Never got produced, but uh, still, uh, it's still bubbling, right? It's not. It's not dead, is it? Well, it's in the hands. Uh, I took a buyout in 2015. Show you how long it's been around. Uh, I took a buyout in 2015 because uh, it was just moving at such a slow pace, and all these boomer producers that were uh, attached to it, you know, just like had totally different expectations and stuff. And uh, it just we were butting heads, and it, it wasn't good. So um, took a buyout, and now it's in the hands of uh, Christian Alvart. He's a uh, director. If like a Renee Zellweger or something wants to make a German film, she'll make it with Christian Alvart. Uh, and he's he turned his company owns the property now. Has the shift in the marketplace as far as there's all these streaming services, right? And they're starved for content. One might think that those would be good avenues to get a project like that off the ground or something else that you want to do. Um, but I would like to hear your take on that. Well, I think the world is glutted with more product than it is seeking product. I think there's still an imbalance. Um, and so the streamers can basically, you know, the streamers, unless it's a established um, producer with a track record, uh, the streamers are not doing a lot of development and stuff. I think they're, as far as feature films, they're taking stuff that already has a GIF, you know, is GIF wrapped with a bow on it. Uh, something that's across the finish line already. Um, there's a lot of goalposts moving in independent film. Uh, I, I've really, it's really kind of bleak out there for independent film, any kind of middle class, what I, you know, what used to be low budget. It's, you know, now the stuff that gets made is micro budget. It's not my bag, man. I'm not saying yes to it. Uh, I still want to hold the line and believe that we can have something called low budget. Uh, I know you do unboxings of horror pack, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the founder of horror pack is a guy named Chris Etheridge. Uh, here in Atlanta recently, he optioned a action screenplay of mine. And uh, he tried very, very hard for two years uh, to get it made under that option. And um, so it used to be, here's how it would work. You would, uh, you would have a good script. You would retain a casting director for about five, anywhere from 5K, 10K, 15K. You would retain a casting director. And then they would send that script out to movie stars and movie stars would actually read something that came from a casting director. Um, and we tried for like two years under that model and we were never, we weren't even getting definitive notes. We were just letting our offer uh, with our offer uh, kind of deadline lapse and the movie stars weren't even reading it. And we eventually just learned that the goalposts have moved. Move, uh, movie stars don't even read uh, scripts that aren't fully funded from beginning. So that just puts this giant catch-22, this holding pattern. How do you break out of that? Used to be you would get a movie star attached and then you could get a budget. But now you need a budget to get a movie star. So, uh, you know, it just seems like the dirty secret in an independent film is it's a bunch of trust, trust fund kids making these movies. Um I, it just feels like it's been become this closed off arena. Yet another reason I'm in Blu-ray supplements at this time of my life. Are you happy in Blu-ray supplements? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Um, it, you know, the 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 word that I use that you kind of uh, you know agree to was a treadmill. Uh, it feels like a treadmill of work. It feels nonstop. But uh, you know, 
man's lot in life is to work and be happy in it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm doing stuff I'm vitally interested in. I could be out there selling storm windows, uh, but I'm doing something I'm vitally interested in. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, 12 to 16 hour days sometimes. But, uh, you know, like I said, I get to see stuff come across the finish line. That keeps me sane. I get to, you know, see stuff on my shelf there. Uh, you know, it's a nice feeling. And it's stuff I'm vitally interested in. I only say yes to... Well, here's the thing. I say yes to movies in the tough guy genre. I don't say yes to horror, action, or, or well. So I distinguish tough guy and action. Uh, the reason I say tough guy, which is necessarily a sexist term, you can't get more sexist than that. But I, I do like movies about tough women. I just say tough guy to differentiate it from action because action to me has become somebody in a Lycra bodysuit doing triple backflips, spraying machine gun fire into henchmen and stuff. That's not my bag. I like tough guy stuff. I like toughness of character. So I say yes to tough guy stuff, even if I don't like the movie. Like, uh, yeah, talk about telling tales out of school. Uh, 10 to Midnight, Charles Bronson. Eh, it's not really my bag. Another film he did for Canon, um, Murphy's Law. I said yes to both of those because I like Charlie and I like the genre. Uh, but, you know, I'm not crazy about either of those films. So what do I do? I kind of pivot and I do my supplement about the subgenre that it's in. In the case of Murphy's Law, it's the people handcuffed together, the, um, you know, odd couple handcuffed together kind of subgenre. In the uh, case of um, uh, 10 to Midnight, I did the what I call the 80s cop sleaze movement uh where all of a sudden guys like uh pacino and bronson and eastwood and friedkin uh they were just doing all these sex oriented cop films uh so you know that's that's always the the telltale sign if you see malloy on a disc and he's talking about the subgenre instead of the film that means he wasn't just bowled over by the film itself now we know it's a good trick though because it gets you the employment and you are an expert on what you're talking about you've clearly done the work you know exactly what you're talking about i will reference uh you know this uh the new blu-ray for nick the sting uh which is a fernando de leo film and you have a wonderful uh feature about split screen in the 60s and 70s and i want to know how many hours that took to edit i mean that seemed like a lot of work yeah, that's that's the kind of that's uh, emblematic of the kind of stuff I'm liking to do these days is uh, do a subgenre. And it's kind of what I call the mini doc format where these labels, they don't have the budget for me to interview a bunch of people. But if I rewatch the films and I email some of the people involved with some of the movies and stuff and I can incorporate their, you know, their their anecdotes and stuff just through me as a talking head and, uh, you know, put some polish and cleverness into the editing then, you know, I think that's a worthwhile 20 minutes. Um, so split screen, I was able to debut for the first time ever. I have a buddy, uh, Joe D'Augustine. He edits some, of, he edited some of Tarantino's films. Um, he worked with uh, Pablo Ferro uh, on some projects and Pablo Ferro did the split screen on Thomas Crown Affair. And so, um, and that split screen is done through a piece of equipment called an optical printer. And Joe had some footage that had never seen the light of day of Pablo working with an optical printer. And so I was able to debut that in my little 20 minute doc for that release you reference there. So um, yeah, I'm always pleased. Like uh, the other day I was doing something on Lee J Cobb for a label and I messaged uh, this. Um, so Lee J. Cobb made two films over in Italy with this uh, young, dreamy, gosh, awful, handsome star named Franco Gaspari. And uh, Franco was no longer with us, but I was able to message his brother on Facebook. And I was expecting his brother to just send back some, some text reply, but his brother happened to send a audio, a voice message. And I messaged him back as like, hey, this is great info. Can I just include your voice message in my video? And he says, by all means. So I, you know, I'm not going out and on these, these, you know, razor thin margins. I'm not going out and interviewing other people and making it a full doc and with talking heads and stuff like I did in Eurocrime, but I am getting that firsthand info anyways, and just kind of working it in through my script as a talking head. Do you see these, these features, mini docs leading to full docs? Do you see the potential there for expanding on some of this stuff? Well, you know, oh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question because you leave tons of information. You always leave tons of information out, but, uh, you know, these things, 
you know, sometimes like I'm juggling so many external hard drives all the time. I'm sure that like I would open up a um, premiere project sometimes and just have all kinds of broken links just because this was on this hard drive and this is on, that's just the pace you have to work at. Uh, this, you know, file management kind of goes by the wayside. So I think that would be pretty messy and sloppy. It's sometimes nice. Yeah, I, yeah, I am ultimately pleased with Blu-ray because you can kind of like put a pin on it and uh, move on and but yeah, you're right. Uh, there's tons of tons of information that doesn't make the cut. In fact, for a while there, you know what I was doing? I would write a script. And then at the very end, I would have this bogus frequently asked questions uh, segment as if people had emailed in questions. And I would just work in random factoids that didn't fit the flow of the script. I would uh, you know, sit there and read on camera and uh, be rather... Uh, rather gruff and impolite to the people uh, asking the questions. But then again, I wrote the question. So you also could put this, this stuff in, in a book. You come from writing. You have so much experience in writing. Uh, I know that less people read, but people do still read. Do you feel a call to put this back in a book to, to start, you know, and or, or even if you were just doing some sort of articles that you were self-publishing somewhere or, or getting out there on your own? So yeah, uh, doing the on-camera work and then having to edit it and everything later is uh, much more labor intensive than writing for the printed page, right? Or writing the printed word. Um, but the trade-off, because everything in life is a trade-off, everything in life is a double-edged sword. Uh, the trade-off is I think I connect with an audience better uh, by you know them seeing my face and you know whatnot. So I'm kind of content where I am. I don't really need to the the feel the need to regress back to writing. Uh, that said. I do have a long suffering hard work uh, book on David Carradine's four personal films um, and, you know, David Carradine, the lost auteur. And um, I could, I could tell you about what that project has kind of evolved into right now, but I'm under a um, NDA. So, uh, but I do have a book project that I'm going to get to. Uh, I'm going to get back to very soon, hopefully. And uh, yeah, it's a, that's, those are the kind of stories that I really connect to is somebody who is willing to suffer for his or her art. And David Carradine, a lot of people don't realize they think he was uh, in acting to act, but he was in acting as his kind of day job money that he was funneling into a John Cassavetes kind of career and a cruel twist of irony. He made four films that never really got properly released and um, people know him from the acting and not what he really wanted to do. Yeah, I know you don't like the H word, but that's what you're like. That's history that we need to know that that that's journalism. And that's important, man. I'm just a tough guy for trying to tell the stories of other tough guys. Eh, you leave that H word for the. Uh, well, I won't mention any of my colleagues. How would you um, how how I want to ask you about working with some of these. You've been pretty vocal about like MGM working, doing work for MGM. Are you? Do you feel comfortable talking about that? Well, we'll just say studio stuff in general. Uh, the the good news is there's a prestige that comes with that. The bad news is that um, they um, they want to have approval over every word you say, uh, which is pretty crazy because, you know, we have a disclaimer at the front of disc, right? Yeah. Uh, which get them off the hook for anything I might say. But um, yeah, I just did a job earlier this year for Studio Canal. And it was very nice. And hopefully it gets seen by a lot of people. But um, the trade off there was they wanted me to use no poster art. So, you know, all the cutaways and stuff, which really, you know, you don't realize how much that stuff enhances a talking head until you lose it. Uh, but they didn't want me to use any cutaways. What there's any reason for that? Well, because there again, instead of talking about the film itself, I was talking about the subgenre from whence it came. I was talking about it was the movie was Blazing Magnum, which is a kind of uh, Euro crime film that was shot in Canada. And so I talked about the Canadian and Italian co-productions of the 1970s. That was the so subject of my video. And uh, so if I had made it specifically about Blazing Magnum and only used artwork from Blazing Magnum, I think that would have been OK because they had licensed that title. But I wanted to talk about all the. So I talked about eight different films or something uh, that were co-produced that decade by those two countries. And, uh, you know, they they felt a little squirrely about me using posters and whatnot from all those. It boggles the mind because it's, yeah. it's yeah. On the, the, the Norris thing, for some reason, I've, I've somehow MGM has a reputation for being very, very uh, uptight about what goes in there. Uh, but somehow I've done four uh, supplements for MGM, MGM titles and they've all skated. 
So uh, I have learned little tricks on the Norris one I did. They they asked that I uh, put a work cited kind of uh, section in my closing credits, and I did that. And uh, you know that's probably a good idea. I probably should learn from that. Um, but yeah, I did that. And then I also, you know, little tricks like uh, instead of saying sued, because, uh, you know, uh, Norris, you know, worked on a bunch of early films that he was not very pleased with when they came out later in his career. Uh, and he uh, tried to enjoin one of them. Uh, he tried to enjoin um, Slaughter in San Francisco, tried to keep it, suppress it, keep it from coming back out. And, uh, you know, instead of saying sued to block the release, I just said block the release. I just dropped the word suit or lawsuit or enjoined, um, you know, euphemize it without uh, really defanging it, hopefully. That's interesting. Just choice of words makes all the difference. Yeah. But no poster art. <laughs> no, no other poster art for that one. Uh, no, no, uh, I never I never got the uh, memo on the Norris thing. So I used poster art galore. And uh, yeah, it skated. Uh, you you recently uh, said that you're working on something with Radiance Films. I just talked to Fran a few episodes ago here on my podcast. No he was talking about you know what's coming what's coming up. Tell me a little bit about that your involvement with that upcoming box set. Oh yeah, I did a um, Radiance uh, is uh, you know really poised to kind of be like another Criterion, I guess, because they they got. Um, not only classy titles, but they got, uh, you know, really classy, uh, you know, sleeve design and uh, everything and really trying to put a lot of care into the presentation. So, uh, yeah, very pleased to be working with them. The weird thing is, is that, you know, Fran came from Arrow, as you know, as most of your listeners even know. Uh, Fran came from Arrow and uh, I was starting to, I had only in the, you know, nine years I've been doing this, I only got tapped to be on one Arrow release. And it's kind of time consuming when Arrow comes out with a Eurocrime release and I have to field a bunch of questions every single day from fans saying, hey, Mike, why weren't you on this? It's like, I don't know. Ask Arrow. Um, so I was starting to wonder if I was persona non grata over at Arrow. But you got to remember that these things are just kind of very click oriented and people just kind of go again to people they've worked with and done good work for and stuff. So I don't think I was persona non grata. And then that was nice to hear from Fran after he left Arrow and be on an early wave of one of his Radiance releases. That was very nice. So uh, clearly there's, you know, no ill will. Yeah, I'm really hoping there's no ill will. I, if, if there was, you wouldn't be on that release. Probably. He's a good guy. I'm really excited about what he's doing. Um, he, he knows he knows the stuff and he wants to bring movies that he loves to disc, which is exciting because he's, you have to balance the commercial aspect of these things, but it's exciting to see someone leading with their passion, which is essentially what you do too. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to keep blowing smoke, but like you lead with your passion. You do things, you do things because you want to do them, not because you feel, uh, you know, well, this is a, a good, a good chess move towards a, a bigger goal. You know, you're, you're turning down things that you don't believe in. And uh, I think that takes guts and I applaud that. Yeah, I was asked on another interview. Um, he's like, uh, so what's your secret, Mike? You're just uh, filling a niche, filling a gap. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess I am because so much of uh, genre cinema is oriented towards horror. But the the good news is I'm, un I'm not straining to fill a gap. I'm not unnaturally filling a gap. These are my naturally occurring interests. So it all just works out. Yeah. And that way you're always satisfied with uh, your own. If you follow your own star, you're you know you're doing the right thing it's when you when you start doing things for other people and doing things that don't feel right to you that you can find yourself off course so i applaud that um we, we're winding down we didn't really we didn't really talk about the man boyification of uh of anything do you want to hit some of that while we're here <laughs> do you want to <laughs> uh i mean like, hopefully i've ingratiated myself with some of your listeners no reason to alienate them right now where what do you where can they buy what's uh what's coming up that you would recommend people keep their eyes out uh to uh to support you with uh well anytime i plug a release it's more about supporting those labels that have chosen to employ me i've already gotten paid uh so i really just uh, some of these upstart labels i really want to see them succeed um in the past couple of years i've worked for a whole bunch of startups uh, you mentioned radiance that was probably my most recent startup uh i worked for uh did a couple of gigs for cauldron films uh, you may know them. Uh, they're also, uh, you know, the same basic ownership as uh, Diabolic, the um, online retailer. Um, uh, 
culture shock releasing, which became a uh, imprint of uh, vinegar syndrome recently, uh, you know, did a job from them last year. So just who would have told me that there'd be all these startups? Like when I started this in 2013, if you had told me that Blu-ray would be healthier nine years later and that it'd be working for a bunch of startups, I would have told you you're a crackpot. Let's talk about that for just a second, because I, I didn't want to lean too heavy in discs here, but I would like you to expand on that because Blu-ray does seem healthy. Everybody's all, you know, the sky is falling. It's all like people ask me, what are you going to do when players aren't for sale anymore? It's really not something I'm concerned about, but I'd like to hear your take on this. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly Blu-ray has found its stride as a collector's format. I thought it was a mainstream format in the early day. I do love the fact that we've all standardized everything to size and shape of a shiny plastic round disc you know from your vcds to your cds to your dvds to your blu-rays i do think 4k was a mistake for the industry i think it's just diversifying people and customers across too many formats i think there's diminishing returns i know 4k was the native format for 35 millimeter film and so that's why they've settled on it and that's why it's a selling point and everything i don't think my eye appreciates 4k any more than 1080 um i kind of wish we had just left off with uh blu-ray you know nice square pixels um, you know, I, I, I hate to see the customer base, uh, which is, you know, this niche customer base, I hate to see them divided across too many, uh, formats. Do you think that part of it is, uh, TV sales that 4k has been introduced to help prop up sinking sales? Yeah, possibly. Uh, but the, them is just technophiles. Them guys is, uh, you know, I don't know, half of them are just bragging about their new TV and they're watching streaming anyways. And streaming is uh, such an inferior way for, you know, picture quality. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, like, I, I just really, I really wish we could have stopped with 1080 and just kind of consolidated the market and, you know, just uh, really try to make that as healthy as possible. Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, that's just another arms race is, uh, you know, 4K is great as a shooting format. Because, you know, if you were just doing a 1080 delivery, then you can recompose and everything. Uh, you know, I've loved it as a shooting format, but, uh, you know, I hate to see that it's become a delivery format too. Well, here's my last question for you. Is there anything that's happening right now that excites you film-wise, you know, actor-wise, entertainment-wise? Is there anything that you're really enjoying that's connecting with you? Oh, man. Uh, like you would have asked me this, like, eight years ago or something. And I was said, Oh, well, that David Ayer director, he's kind of cool. He, uh, you know, grew up in South Central and then joined the Navy and now he's making tough guy films, but he's become yet another casualty to the superhero stuff. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's looking pretty grim All out there. Guys, and they make a great movie and then they get sucked into the machine. Yeah. That's the career path nowadays. Uh, you know, there's no middle class. So the reason the seventies were so great is not only because it was director oriented and we've had director oriented, uh, stuff, uh, with no studio interference. I mean, no, no filmmaker by committee stuff. Uh, we've had that in the past, you know, the forties film noir was because those were the B pictures and everybody, the studios were concerned with their color a pictures. So they were leaving these film noir directors alone to do what they want. And that's why those films have endured better than the a pictures from that time, the seventies, we had it again. And then the nineties, we had an indie boom. But the 70s were great and they stand head and shoulders above any of these other periods where the director had free reign because the, you know, it was kind of geared towards middle aged guys. These middle aged guys in the 70s had in the 40s, they had served in World War II and stuff like that. They, Korea, they had seen real danger. Uh, it just my favorite movies of all time are the intersection of new Hollywood and tough guy cinema. Uh, you know, the Lee Van Cleef's, the Charles Bronson's, the Lee Marvin's, those guys all saw combat duty in World War II. And it was just great. And so then you have the 90s indie boom, and that's director oriented again. So it should be good, right? But it's, you know, comic book nerds like uh, 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 Kevin Smith. Uh, you got comic book nerds like him, you got video store guys like uh, Tarantino. So it was written from art instead of written from life. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't see a lot of stuff written from life anymore. Um, so yeah, the 70s have yet to be topped. Well, there you have it. That was, wasn't that riveting? This, doesn't it make you want to go watch 70s crime movies? Doesn't it make you want to go? Uh, it makes me wish that I still had access to a blockbuster or to a mom and pop video store so that I could just go wander the aisles and be like, oh, there's one. 
we are so much of this, as I said in the intro to this video, so much of this stuff is back on the table now. So if you want to see some of these movies, this is the best time in the last, I'm going to say 30 years, probably since they these movies were in theaters in the first place. This is the best time to rediscover these movies because they're finally getting uh, the legitimacy that they deserve, the attention that they deserve. And I am going to be keeping an eye on Mike Malloy to see what's coming next. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode and for watching this episode. You can support this podcast or this YouTube channel by engaging, by giving it thumbs ups, by subscribing. Please subscribe. Uh, please tell your friends about it. You know, I say this a lot. There are billions, presumably, of, uh, of podcasts and of YouTube channels. It is harder than ever to connect with an audience to get your stuff seen in the first place. So anything that you can do to help Serial at Midnight establish a connection with new people, we, we need to be discovered. The podcast uh, needs to be found. So if you can help us with that, I do really appreciate it. You can email the show at serialmidnight at gmail.com. Uh, I'll put my social media links in the description of this video as well. Please don't forget to go check out Mike Malloy's YouTube channel, Tough Guy Movie Expert Mike Malloy. Uh, which is linked in the description with everything else. And um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all of the comments and the feedback and for uh, just for being a part of the Serial at Midnight, you know, whatever this is. This doesn't exist without you. And I'm so glad that you're here. I appreciate your time. And uh, I'm excited about what's coming in the next few weeks, the days, weeks, and months. It's an exciting time. Things are continuing to grow. And, uh, and I appreciate that you are here to experience this with me. Guys, thank you so much. Until next time, I will catch you next.